Welcome everyone to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and with me is Anthony and Tony, and yes, they're two different people. Tony calls himself Mushu, and Anthony just calls himself Anthony because he's normal. Yeah. But um, so, <laughs> what we have tonight, we have a show for you, uh, but first let's get, let's get the prelim things out of the way here. We have my email address, Josh Turner at Paranormal Roundtable, or is it Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Josh Turner, PRTPodcast.com. You got to send me your stories and uh, I can retell them or we can discuss it. You can come on and tell them. It's up to you. Uh, and then you want to tell them about the Patreon? Yeah, so the Patreon is patreon.com slash PRTPodcast. And of course, as always, it's linked down below in the description of the YouTube upload. Uh, we got uh, five tiers ranging from $10 to $50. The more you sign up for, the more you get. We, we give all of our patreon patrons a uh, swag bag with all kind of cool stuff in there autograph books a shirt maybe even a hoodie stickers uh, keychains regardless of what tier you sign up for you're going to get back more than your money's worth it's really important to us that we make it worth your while because you give us you give us your time and you give us your money and y- y'all are y'all are just great so thank you yep the 40 dollars tier you get one of my books and then two uh, autograph books from someone else and the 50 dollars tier you get both of my books and one of the autograph books from someone else yep so if you're into the show and you like you like the, the the encounters, they're they're in those books. And so that being said, we're gonna we're gonna get started here. We also oh, one other thing we have the the, the zip up hoodies that everybody's been demanding. They're in the store now. Go get yeah. them, and they're there for 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 Christmas, whatever. And you can find the link to the merch store again linked in the description of the YouTube video. So just go down there. It's, it's going to say shop and there's going to be a link. You click on that and you'll, uh, it'll take you right to our merch store. So th- that being said, is there anything else we need to do? Oh, the Facebook group, uh, join the, the Paranormal Roundtable Facebook group, join Paranormal Lounge uh, in Humanoids of Barton Nunley. Those are all groups that we have, we do. Um I guess that's it. Just go join those. There's a bunch of content and stuff in there. If you're if you're listening to the podcast, we've said this before. Go listen to the live stream every Friday and Sunday. Friday we have a guest every Friday and every Sunday we retell people's encounters. You're missing out three hours each time, and it's not like it is here where it's just all stories. And then you know we we interact with the fans, the listeners, you you the listeners, and we just we have a lot of fun. We talk about all kinds of stuff and we, you know, when, when the guests come on and, you know, sometimes we have Q and A's and just, it's just, it's a whole different ball of wax and you just check it out. All right. So that being said, let's get started. I'm eager to get started on this one. This one, it, it was, you know, I, I wanted to do like a paranormal potluck. That may be something we do next week, but, but right now I had a lot of stories that I had to talk about and it was, it involved things coming into people's houses <laughs> And in this, these these stories are really weird. It's not well; they all are, I guess. You know, to to the uninitiated. But these stories are, are are disturbing because if you go to my book, Werewolves and the Dogman Phenomena, that's available on Amazon. I'm not trying to plug the book again. I'm just saying there were there was a chapter in there, and it was all about people having encounters with these uh, beings um, that I don't know. They defy the logic. Okay. Nick Redfern, very prominent author in this field, has written bunches and bunches of books. And I've talked to him many, many times. He's a good friend of mine. And he had an encounter that he gave me that he had only told on on uh, a website that he writes for. He had never given it to anybody else. And he, t- he told me other than like he had never put it in anybody's book. And he let me put it in the book. And it was about his encounter with a wolf-like creature that was walking on two legs and the weird thing, like it was like, there was like this cloak, you know, and you get that a lot of times you'll hear this stories of these creatures and they will be wearing like a type of clothing. And it's really bizarre. And people have asked me, do you consider this to be a dog man? Do you think it's a werewolf? What do you think it is? I don't know what it is. All I know is it's canid and it shows up in people's bedrooms now we may drift off a little bit into some other cryptid type encounters that that but it's all about things showing up in the bedroom without permission. <laughs> Nobody's asking these things to come or did they? That's the question and maybe we can answer that. So 
What we're going to talk about right now, I'm going to get started. The first encounter, this one This one came, of course, that we've been doing a lot of work in Latin America, and this one came from Argentina, and it was a, it was Buenos Aires, but it wasn't Argentinian people that it, this happened to. They were actually from Mexico City, and they went to vacation in Argentina, and they were on their third day, and they were having a really good time, and they went to a market, an open market, in a small uh, uh, area outside of well, Buenos Aires, They were passing through and they decided that they were going to stop and, and look at the, the wares, you know, check out what the person had. One of the things that they found they thought was really neat was this marble. It was carved out of marble and it was a wolf's head, but it was an innocuous thing. It wasn't like, you know, and when something has something attached to it, it doesn't necessarily scream out at you, Hey, I'm cursed. (laughs) You know, there's no warning label. You're at the Mercado and then it's like, you know, you see this uh, wolf-headed creature, Something whatever. Something just catches your eye. It, ca- and it was, and it, it, when, when, when I saw the, what it looked like, it didn't look like anything, you know, or whatever. But I'm going to be real honest. I, I'm, I'm just going to tell you the truth. It was just a marble cut carving. You could tell it was very unique. Somebody had carved it by hand, whatever. Um. I didn't like the picture, (laughs) and so I deleted it. That's me. I'm not super superstitious, but, you know, we have a haunted key. I I don't know what you call it. Cursed? Yeah, I guess so. I guess. It shows up at will, and it's it's missing now again, but it'll show back up. You watch. Um, Very weird thing that goes on. It's been going on for years. I've shown people, many people, that this thing, it's a real phenomena. Uh, but, uh, th- this thing just looked like, I, I don't know if they're having all these problems, I don't want it. I don't want it on my computer even. I don't want the picture. I'm sorry. But they took it back to the hotel, their hotel in Buenos Aires when they, when they finished the, the trek that they were on and they went back and they did some hiking and some other things. And, and it was, it was this little market. There was a, a few kilometers from the, the base of where they were going to hike from, and they had fun, except that uh, their daughter. There were there were there was a there were a man and his wife, and uh, they had a daughter and they had a son. The son brought his girlfriend. He's a little older. The daughter's like sixteen, and the son is like you know twenty two, whatever. And he brought his 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 girlfriend. Well, his girlfriend twisted her ankle really bad, and guess what? She had this stone thing, this marble thing in her pocket. Now. That's only one little thing, and you could think, you know what? That's not supernatural. She stepped wrong. Maybe she's clumsy. I don't know. Maybe you know. I don't know these people personally, you know. But Marietta, the the mother, she says, "Look, I, I, it was so weird. It was like we're walking on what what was really a pretty straight, smooth surface, and she she falls. It was almost like something pushed her, and she even said she felt like something touched the the bottom of her back." And pushed her. She could feel it. And she was like on the on the far end of them. And she thought somebody had done it. And she looked. There was nobody around her. Of course, they were with two other little groups of people. There was nobody that, that pushed her. And everybody thought it was really odd. But she, she ends up twisting her ankle really bad. Well, sprained it, I guess. And so then she can't walk. So she, she ends up having to stay behind. And then they go back to the hotel in Buenos Aires. She goes through her pockets. She finds the little trinket, and she's like, that's weird, you know. When she fell, it put a really big bruise on her leg. And uh, I asked the, the the woman that I talked to, I said, did she did she tell you anything? Like, did it did it feel like something? And she said, yes, it did. The first night that, that they were there, they went down to eat, and they had to bring food up to her because her leg was messed up, and they had two, three, like three more days, I think she said like uh, three days and two nights or whatever. And she said that uh, her, her ankle was messed up, but she was a good sport about it. She didn't go, well, you can no, just, you know, you got to stay here with me. You know, she didn't tell her boyfriend, you know, because I hurt my leg. She encouraged him to go and finish doing what they were going to do and, and with the family. Enjoy their time. You know? Enjoy their time, whatever. And of course he, he, he did a little, but he also hung back with her some. So when they went down to eat, he went down, he got her food, and when he came back, she was in a deep sleep. So he just sat there watching TV <clears throat> while they went out and did some stuff. And he, her boyfriend, nice guy, he decides that, you know, she looked uncomfortable, you know. Um, 
he lays next to her. He gets her comfortable, you know, and he, he falls asleep. But she, she starts to kind of talk in her sleep. Now, I asked, you know, the woman that I talked to, I said, this is your son. Does, did he ever... Was, did, did he ever report that she had done this before? She said, no. There was never any sign that there was anything weird that had ever happened to this person to make her talk and do anything that was beyond, you know, the norm. Uh, she didn't sleepwalk that they knew of. She said that there was no, you know, nothing weird. But she said that that he <clears throat> wakes up with her kind of like, you know, rocking her head back and forth and she's talking like gibberish. She can't understand, make heads or tells if it's not Spanish, they speak Spanish. They also, they mostly speak English as a second language. They could, most of them can speak English. Um, but he, they, they couldn't, he couldn't understand what she was saying. But then he understood a little bit of it and it turned out what she was saying was Latin. But it was kind of like Latin mixed with like gibberish. It wasn't anything he could understand. And he, she kept babbling and, and whatever. So finally he shakes her awake. And what was really weird, this is the, the the really weird thing that happened. The first thing that was really weird besides the ankle sprain, which may or may not have been weird, you know, but she reaches up and she like tries to claw his face and he pulls away and he's like, for a split second, her eyes shifted into this like yellow look. They had like this bright yellow, like kind of glow about them. And he said that she kind of set up and her eyes, not only were they yellow, but they went up like, you know, like somebody opens their eyes really, really wide. Yeah. And it was like she, her eyebrows morphed into this weird wolf looking kind of look about her and her face for a split second almost looked like it elongated. And he was like, whoa. But he told his mother, he's like, it was like something out of a movie. Like, you know, you see like this person that kind of like snaps at somebody, you know, like they, 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 for a split second, they're like a werewolf or something. So he had this really weird thought, you know, so he gets up and he goes over to the, to, to the table. She lays back down, goes to sleep like it didn't even happen. And he, as he's getting ready to walk downstairs to go see, talk to his family, he sees that little wolf's head thing that they had bought. So he grabs it for some reason. He didn't, he couldn't say why. And he put it in his pocket and he decided to go downstairs and he says he goes and gets to, goes to get in the elevator. And when he does, Another weird thing happened. As the elevator door's closing, he hears really loud, like boom, 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 like somebody's running toward the elevator. And then as the elevator is just about to start to go down, he sees the doors kind of rock, like something smacks into it really hard. And he's like, and I don't know why. He told his mother, he goes, I don't know why, but I had this image in my head of this big werewolf-like creature. Just, you know, and he's like, I don't know if it's because of the thing I had in my pocket because I was looking at it or if it was because of what happened with my girlfriend. He couldn't explain it, but he gets downstairs and he's all shook up. He's really freaked out. And they're they're down there and they're they're eating and they're like, oh, are you going to go with us, you know, to the, the whatever they were going to do? And he said, no, nah, I'm going to go back upstairs. But uh, I had something really weird happen. But he didn't, at that point, he didn't proceed to tell them everything or whatever. So they, they talk for about an hour and then he goes back up. He goes back up and he says, when, when he gets up, she's up and she's really, it's really strange. And this is the part that I, I really was like, this is, this has got, has got to be something weird here. She's sitting up and she's at one of the, t at the, the table. There's like a table and there's a desk. She's sitting at the table. He goes and pulls the chair out from the desk and he sits down and he starts talking to her and he tells her, he's like, how did you get up out of the bed and go, go across the room like that without, you know, with, with the pain and whatever. And she says, oh, I'm fine. They, she, they gave, they had given her crutches, right? She, he, they weren't even moved. She's like, I don't know. My ankle's healing. He's like, yeah, but it's a high ankle sprain. It <laughs> happened yesterday, you know, and you should be, you know, still hurting, and she's like, I don't know. It's healing quickly. It's like something, <clears throat> I don't know. And so he, at that time, and I don't know if I totally buy this. I mean, I'm not saying he's lying or whatever, because I don't judge people like that. But but he said that he felt like it had something to do with that, the marble thing. And I was like, really? That quickly you thought that? 
And so I asked her, his mother, she said, yeah, he was thoroughly convinced that it had something to do with that. It was that quick. And at first I kind of didn't, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe he just, it was like hindsight, you know, that in hindsight, you look at something, you're like, oh, I saw that, you know, but in reality, you're just, it's just the, the hindsight is twenty twenty. you know what I mean? And so when I asked his mother, I said, you don't, you don't think it's maybe something to where maybe after the fact that he thought that she's like, no, he said that he felt like something, right. It was something that had something to do with that, with that deal. And so that night, the night before, get this, his girlfriend told him that she had that, that thing in her pocket. When she came back to the hotel room, she had stuck it under her pillow because she couldn't get up to go put it. So she didn't know what to do with it. She went to throw it on the floor and she was exhausted. She just stuck it under the pillow and slept with it underneath her pillow. And I'm going to tell you what happened. But before I do, it was a really weird thing, right? Her ankle is no longer like destroyed. Like they said it was swollen. It was really bad. And then he, then the weird thing with the, the dream or whatever, what she was dreaming, he said, you know, you had a really weird dream and you sat up and you tried to smack me, you know, and it's like, she's like, you tried to claw my face and she has really long nails anyway. So it's not like her nails were grown unnaturally. And he said, I'm wondering, you know, what, what were you dreaming about? She's like, I don't remember. She's like, I remember running, but I was like, I was running on all fours and something was chasing me. And then she goes, but last night, and this when she told him, I put this this stone under my this marble figure figurehead thing. I put it under my pillow, and I went to sleep. And she says, and in in, in the middle of the night, I'm awakened. The door to the to the hotel is, is is open. She's like, and I'm sitting there, and I see this like man come in. And she's like, and I recognize him as this guy that works as a bellhop. He's one of the bellhops. He's like, and he he's so weird. Like she says, he gets down on all fours and starts kind of jumping around the room like a dog. And then he proceeds to take his shirt off and starts to roll around on the floor. And, it, and she's like, and I see this weird, like yellowy looking light coming from where he's at. She's like, I sit up in, in, in the bed and she's like, and, and she's like, it was a dream, right? This is a dream. And then she looks and she's like, he has no clothes on. And and right before my eyes, his head begins to morph and it becomes this wolf-like head. And then his whole body starts to elongate. And she said it was like a painful looking process, but it was quick. It was pretty quick. And then he sprouted a tail. And the next thing you know, he's this big shaggy wolf. And he comes and he walks over on all fours and goes to the side of my bed. But then he stands up on its on his hind legs. You know, and she's like, and the, the, the legs where there should have been a man's legs are wolf-like legs, but the upper body's like a man. And she says that he leans down and he's like staring at her and growling and snarling. And she reaches up and touches his face. And then she's like, I don't know why I would do this. And I began to stroke his face. And then I just woke up. And she wakes up and she's just like drenched in sweat and freaking out. And she she's like, I look over. She goes, I yelled. I screamed. And she's like, and you didn't, and it's just him and her in that particular room. But he's like, you, I screamed so loud, your, your mom and dad and your sister should have woke up in the next room. And nobody did. Didn't wake him up either. So that was a very weird thing. So he grabs the little marble headed thing, or whatever. He took a couple pictures of it. It doesn't look like anything. It just looks like a, I don't know, like something you'd buy at a flea market, you know? And he takes it. They go to eat dinner the next day. She, she's walking now. Everything's fine. Her her ankle is healed up. And they get in a, in a, in a cab to go to the, to the restaurant they're going to go to. And he takes it and he throws it out the window of the street. Right there in Buenos Aires in the middle of the street. The next day, they wake up. He, he steps out onto the, off the bed. And his sharp pain shoots through from his foot all the way up into his leg. Goes all the way up to his neck. And he looks down and he's stepping on this little marble-headed wolf thing. And he's like looking down at it and he tells his mother the whole story. He's like, I, I was thinking, I thought I got rid of you. I threw you out the window. So 
he gives it to his sister. She says, I want it. I want to keep it. And he says, I don't think you should have it, whatever. So sitting on the table, his dad grabs it and gives it. She, he gives it to, to the sister and says, you can have it. If, if, if they don't want it, you can have it, you know? And she's like, you started arguing with him. And he said it got to the, so, so bad in the argument that he grabbed his sister by the arm and she pulled away and she was like, no, it's mine. And while they're arguing, he, he sits up and says, I, you really need to give that back to me. There's something wrong with it. She got so mad that she smacked him with it and hit him like in the cheek and gave him like a, a, a bump on his cheek. And so he got really mad and he shoved her and he's like, we've, he's like, it wasn't a, a, a relationship where we would fight. And my sister, you know, we were about six years apart in age. We didn't really fight, you know, and they always got along really well. This is what the mother was telling me that these kids were not like that. And so for her to be smacking him with that, that rock and then him to, to be so demanding was not characteristic of them. So then she, the, the daughter go, goes up to the room, takes a shower. Mother goes upstairs. Daughter tells her, she gets up to the, to the, the hotel room. Daughter's hysterical. She says, I was taking a shower and something walked into the bed, into the bathroom where I was showering. She's like, I see something through the, there was like one of those frosted glass doors, whatever. She's like, I see something moving around. It's big and black. I can't make it out. She's like, but I hear a, a, a scraping sound and I could tell that it was that little statue head being pushed across the, the, the counter of the whatever. So she says, I get all the courage I can. She's like, I close my eyes and then I opened them and I, I just opened the, the, the door to the shower. And she's like, and right there before me for a split second was this hooded, all black werewolf looking creature. And then it turned and walked out the room and it had that thing in its hand, that, that statue, whatever, the, the head of that statue. She, it looked like, a, like something like maybe it belonged to a body at one time. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but it was, it was very, uh, how do you say it? Like, in my opinion, it just looked kind of like uh, childish, you know, like, like, like if a kid carved it or something, Yeah, didn't put a lot of effort into it. It was like, oh, it's an indigenous, you know, person that carved it. It's really pretty, yeah, very rough. It didn't look like anything. It looked like it might've had a body attached to it at one time or something. And they paid like two bucks for it. It wasn't anything, you know. No. So then she, she she screams at the top of her lungs and she goes and she grabs her phone and she starts calling. Her mom comes upstairs and she, her mom gets the call and she's coming up to the room. So she doesn't answer because she's, you know, she answers the door, opens the door, walks in. Her daughter's freaking out. And she's like, it took everything in me just to get my daughter to calm down and put on clothes. She was just like freaking out, running around the hotel room, just freaking out. And she was like, I'm not, she's like, she just, she's like, she's just in her towel and just was refusing to go back into the bathroom. And so she, she had to like help her daughter dress. She was so that hysterical. So then she, they call the police and they come there and she tells them what happened to the daughter or whatever. And then they, then on the flight back, they're all talking, they're comparing notes, you know, about what had happened. And they're convinced that something supernatural that's centered around that marble statue head was responsible for these encounters. And it didn't, and after they got back to Mexico city, nothing else, there was nothing else that happened. Um, nothing at all. They took this trinket back with them. No. Back home. No. What did they do? Just leave it in the hotel? No, that that whatever that was that she saw that walked oh, out it, of that room. Oh, it walked off with it. it. Walked off with it. You said it, it was like a hooded werewolf looking thing, like a hooded but, werewolf in the so hood. Then, so then, was it wearing? It was wearing like a robe, like a robe, yeah, like, like a robe with a hood. Well, on it. the the way it was described to me was not a robe; it was like a cloak. Okay, like a like a reddish brown cloak, like a scarlet color. You know, from what it looked like to me. Like the color that she or what she said it she said it looked like to the daughter, yeah. it looked like a scarlety redded. You know, um, I wouldn't say as bright as like you know, like the, like a I don't know, I don't know if scarlet's the right like burgundy, word. Yeah. You know? I don't know if it was burgundy either. The way she described it was like you know just a a, a really dull red. 
Yeah. You know, and her mother's very intelligent. I mean, she, she speaks really good English and, and Spanish. She also speaks French. She's really smart. Um, a lot of people that live in Mexico City are pretty intelligent. I mean, there's a, there's a large uh, number of educated people there. Yeah. And Buenos Aires is the same way. It's a very uh, Euro- European type city. There's a lot of Europeans that actually live there too. And uh, it's very cultured. They have a lot of, of uh, weird stories and things that come out of there. Um, but uh, talking to some of the locals, none of them had any idea about what this could be. There was no, they had no, they didn't give them anything. They didn't know what it was. Well, at least I did them a favor by taking that thing off of their hands. I mean, I don't think, them, yeah. I mean, I don't think that that was the, the point of it taking that trinket away from them, but it was an unintended consequence that it exited their lives and could no longer be a, a source of negativity within them. Well, and, and consider this. For anybody who doubts that this kind of thing can happen, dude, there's a lot of stories like this. Uh, but one of the things that I, I, I think about is that it didn't harm them. The, the closest it came to harming them was, you know, her son's girlfriend trying to smack him, you know? Yeah. Um, and then her smacking him in the face with the, with it, which just gave him a little bruise, you know? But it wasn't any harm coming from these entities. And what the significance of this thing was, who knows? I would think that something, it, it could have been something from the indigenous population, maybe something that, would, that they used in their ceremonies or something. Something that had, and they had bestowed a lot of energy. You can put energy into things. Oh, yeah. That's why, like, I was going to say that it it actually made sense to me that it looked pretty, like, crude. That there wasn't a whole lot of detail put into the craftsmanship of it. Because if you're creating an object for the purpose of, of like, putting some kind of curse or witchcraft magic on it, as long as you know what that object is, is supposed to look like, like, what it's supposed to symbolize... That's all that really matters. It doesn't need to look perfect because symbolism is like everything to to these practitioners of these dark arts. And I think that there's a significance in knowing what that thing is supposed to be. And like, it's just like a, it's a practical thing. You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't need to be perfect or pretty as as long as like, Hey, I'm going to put a curse on this thing. It needs to, the symbolism, it needs to represent this, this particular creature so let me just carve it out real, real crude, real quick, because the point is not how pretty it looks. The point is the, the magic that's on it. Mm-hmm. There was another story I had gotten, and this one's another weird one. And, and this one happened at a casino, and I, I'd love to tell you the name of it, but I don't know if we should. I, mean, I wouldn't. Probably shouldn't, I guess. I, I want to, but <laughs> but it happened up in, let's put it this way, it happened in Bossier City, okay. Louisiana. Uh, so there's that one, and then there's another one that happened in Rockport uh, here in Texas. There's another one very similar, and then there's another one that happened in uh, Northern California. Oh, Napa Valley. It happened in the Napa Valley. I'm not going to go into the details of where it was at or whatever, but uh, there's three different ones. The one in Napa Valley, I think, would be probably the more interesting one, but the other two are pretty interesting too, so y'all pick which one you want and we'll just we'll then we'll go out there let's do the one in Bozier city Bozier city okay that one <clears throat> so he, this is what happened a guy went he's from texas him and his wife and they went from longview they were living in longview at that time years ago well outside of longview and they they decided to go with they, which they went pretty regularly to Bozier. and at one point i think they even lived in tyler and and here's an interesting little sideline to it when she was young, when she was a teenager, her and her little brother saw a Bigfoot right there in Ty- right there, right outside of Tyler, Texas, which is, we know, the big thickets right there. It's all that that big thick woods, you know, everything, piney woods. And and so they saw um a Bigfoot, you know, like literally crossing the road, uh, or not the road, on a trail. They were on a camp, like they went camp, like a hike, what do you call it? A, a when you're young, you go to a camp, like a summer camp, whatever. Yeah. And there were two other kids, and they were throwing rocks uh, at a tree. <laughs> I kind of wondered about that because they thought that they saw something run behind the tree, so they threw rocks at the tree to get whatever it was to come out from behind the tree. And I said, it worked, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. She said, yes. Yes, it did. And it's it's interesting because her name is Marianne, 
and the lady that we were talking about earlier was Marietta. But it was it was weird. She's got my mother's name, so I thought that was cool. But I was like, I was like, Marianne, you threw rocks at a tree. She was a teenager. She goes, yes, and I was supposed to be one of the camp counselors, and my little brother, and I was. It was stupid. I know. I was trying. She's like, I was trying to convince these younger kids that there was nothing there. We thought. I thought. I thought I saw a shadow. One of them said there was a big hairy looking creature. I said, there's nothing there. We started throwing rocks. Something pops out from behind the tree, but it was so big. She said, it didn't even make any sense. It was like, how did this thing hide behind the tree? I said, it's very weird. That that's Sometimes that's how it works. So something happened. I'm going to get to the, I'm going to tell this story really quickly because I can't tell the other story without this one. But that night, this they see this thing come out behind the tree. They all run. But that night, something came up to their where the cabin where they were at. And it literally knocked the window in and they look and her and four girls were all witnessing this big hairy arm moving around, knocking stuff off of a shelf. And they screamed and freaked out and they all ran and you know to the next cabin and some of the counselors went and got together and they looked. They didn't see anything, but they did find some footprints, you know. Uh, and this happened in like, I think 1994 or something like that. But years later, fast forward years later, and she had a very interesting encounter. Her and her husband went to Bossier City, and they were gambling. And she said, we were winning. We were doing really good. And there was this guy. She's like, he was he was a Texan, too. And she's like, literally, like, J.R. Ewing, like, you know, like Dallas. You know, he had the big hat, and he was, like, rolling, and he was just on fire. And she goes, and me and my husband and my husband's brother and his wife, they were just, you know, we were all betting on this dude, and he was just winning. I mean, he was just winning, winning, winning. And he gets all of his money and he's all like, man, she said he was a real hoot. He was a real nice guy. He was throwing uh, big tips out and the pit bosses were happy. Everybody was happy. Uh, you know, he was winning. And then he gave everybody a big tip and gave, put some money, gave them something. And, went, you know, she said he must have won like $5,200 at that table right there within an hour. Oh, wow. And he was just rolling, you know. And so, but he was very generous and friendly, you know, and he bought everybody drinks and whatever. And so af after that... You know, they they, or they were at the bar, I guess, and he had bought them some drinks, you know, and, and he they talked a little bit. And he had this, uh, like, those bolo ties, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and yeah. And she said that one of them, it had, like, this really, really nice blue stone, and there was turquoise, and it was really pretty. And she said, and he, it was silver. It was a silver, and he just, like, it had a wolf's head on there. And he claimed that he had gotten it at the Native American Reservation. He had bought it a long time ago down in New Mexico. And he says, you know, this is what he told her. He's like, you know, that she's like, Were werewolves are real. She said, what is that? The head of it. You know, he said, that's a werewolf. She's like, well, this, this is the wolf's head. He goes, oh, no, trust me. This is a werewolf. He's like, I got this on a reservation, and it was sold to me by the son of a deceased skinwalker. She's like, at that point in time in my life, I had never heard anything like this before. She's like, Tina, my sister-in-law, says, this is crazy. This guy's full of crap. She says, it really quiet, very, very quiet like that. And there was music, you know? And then he goes, I can hear you. And they were stunned. Huh. Like, around the other side of the bar. And he walks up and he goes, you don't have to believe me. He's like, but I'm going to tell you like this. He goes, werewolves are real. And he winked at her and he walked up to the, you know, and he paid for their tab, you know? And he even put another hundred bucks down and said, let them drink, you know, here's a hundred bucks, have fun. And he's like, I got to get up early tomorrow and head back to Texas. Lived in Dallas and it was time to go. So he left. She's like, that night, she's like, he touched my shoulder. She's like, and it was weird. I felt this weird, like kind of tingling in my shoulder. And she's like, the next, she's like, that night, the next thing I know, I'm waking up, middle of the night. She's like, I'm drenched in sweat, and I see what looks like this blacker than black, shadowy looking thing standing at the foot of my bed. She's like, my husband, I look over, he's sound asleep. I'm shaking him, trying to get him to wake up. And I'm not going to say his name because I don't know if I have permission, but I'll call him William. It's not his real name, but it's close. But she pushes him, and she's like, William, Will, you know, and wake up. And she, he, won't, he won't budge. And then she hears... <sighs> like this growling, snarling that gets louder and louder. And she can't make out really what it is. 
it's really dark in the room, you know, but she can see what looks like horns or something on top of its head. And she's like, this is some kind of demon. This thing's like seven, eight foot tall. And then she sees like the arms kind of go out to the sides and then go back in and then it did it again and again. And she thought, what is this? <laughs> kind of funny right here. She, Cause she wasn't laughing, but it made me laugh. But she was like, it was like, it was doing calisthenics. Huh. And I was Jeez. like, well, you know, and she's like, she's like, I was thinking, what is this thing doing? It came into my room to exercise, you know, doing and, Taibo. Yeah, and she, and she's, she's got this kind of country accent. And she's like, I thought, why is this thing in my room? Is he here to exercise? <laughs> and I was like, well, if it's a demon, you probably needed to exercise it. But anyway, she said it looked demonic. And then she said that all of a sudden she's like, she hears people coming down the hallway and they're talking kind of loud and she can hear it, you know, make it out. And this thing turns and just moves its head really quick to the right and looks out the door or looks toward the door. And then she realizes the door was open like part way. And there was a little bit of light. And as this thing moved toward the door, that little bit of light that was coming in, she got a look at this thing and she's like, Oh my gosh, those aren't horns. This thing has wolf ears. And then she says, dude, I, I like to have fainted right there in the bed. She's like, it was a werewolf. And she's like, I'm telling you, Mr. Turner, she called me Mr. Turner. I said, what, what did it look like? She's like, <clears throat> very black, very black. You couldn't make out like really facial features. You know, it was so dark in the room. But she said that this thing looked like a very, like just a, a very large wolf-like werewolf looking creature. She's like, and then she goes, it goes to the door. It's like, it's there. She's like, it felt like an eternity. And then she said that the door opens and closes. Boom. boom. So it's not like it was, it did, it, 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 you know, in order for it to walk out there, it had to have been a physical thing and at that point. But I asked her that. I said, now, if it was a demon, why would it need to open and close a door? Couldn't it just go through the wall? She's like, yeah, maybe. She's like, but I, I couldn't make out features. And so, she thinks it was like something between physical and, and, and spiritual, you know, but that it was still using the door as in like maybe mimicking human behavior or whatever. So I told her, I said, do you think that it had anything to do? Absolutely, of course. But I had to ask with the guy from the bar, the guy that was rolling the dice, it was doing really well. And she says, absolutely. It had everything to do with that guy. She's like, when he touched my shoulder, something happened. And I asked her this question, and this is a very interesting thing. I told her, I said, Marianne, let me ask you a question. I was like, and I, and I need to know, did this guy, you know, do you think it was him? And she's like, I don't know. I don't know because the thing that he was wearing around his neck, the really pretty tie, she said, he said that it belonged to a skinwalker, that it was made by a skinwalker. And the son, the story that you told, that there was a little more to it. The son had actually told this guy, supposedly, when the guy told them the story, that before his dad had become a skinwalker, which we all know the, the way it happens, right? His mother had gone missing. And that's what he used to do for a living, was make those, those, uh, those bolos. And his wife... She was like, his, this guy's mother was always complaining. She's like, you're not going to make any money doing this. You're this and you're that and complaining, complaining. And he, he was an outdoors kind of guy. He liked to go out and do stuff in the outdoors. And one day they were driving. He goes, I must have been like eight years old. This is the guy that, that, that he got the tie from who sold him, you know. And his dad tells him, he's like, I just want to be free. I want to run through the woods. I want to just run through the desert. I don't want to, I don't want to be tied down. I don't want a family. I don't want a wife. He's like, I want to be free like a wolf. So obviously, I mean, you know, and so he, he sells these things to this guy and he says, my dad, he goes, if you want to believe this is true. He's like, my dad told, he told the, the, this text in that he said, my dad, you know, when he was a skinwalker, he became one. And my mom disappeared. Next thing you know, my dad started doing all these weird things, and he gave him some kind of story. She said she couldn't tell the story she don't she, but because the Texan didn't tell her everything about it. I say the Texan. She's from Texas, too, but this guy was like, you know, stereotypical cowboy. And 
I asked her, I said, do you, do you believe him though? And she said, absolutely, I did. I believed him. She goes, I didn't know what to believe at the time, but now, I mean, what I saw, and I said, do you think that maybe it was something to do with maybe the spirit that could have been attached to that thing? Because that, the guy that made it, could that have been him? Or and maybe the, this guy from, from Texas didn't know, the, the Dallas Texan guy, maybe he didn't know. Or did he know? Did he take on the, 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 you know, the traits of this and did he appear? Was it him? Did her friend see anything that night? No. It was just her? Only her. Yeah, it appeared to her. And she thinks because, you know, he touched her shoulder, but she thinks that maybe he was also kind of attracted to her or something, maybe. I'm wondering, is like, I'm trying to think, like, why, if he did, the Texan didn't know about it, like, if he knew about that creature and was able if he like sent it to her, I'm just trying to think like why her in particular when he was talking to both of them and it seemed like her friend was the one who doubted it more, I think, right? Yeah. Her friend was just, well, it was her sister-in-law. She didn't oh, believe man. it. Yeah. So I was like, why would you show yourself to her and not the sister-in-law? I don't know. Maybe it was because she, he, like he touched her shoulder and yeah. had more of a conversation with her and maybe it was just something... I don't know, maybe something he projected to her, or maybe it was... It's just a weird story overall. I mean, it's like, Dogman just shows up out of nowhere, but it's still using doors, and like, like it creeped in there, like some kind of ninja, but it's like, mm -hmm. how? You know, why, why do this stuff? Why do any of it? Well, them? she also said that she had, she had been drinking pretty heavily that night, too. So I asked her, I said, at the time that it happened, and get this, it was three, she said it was three in the morning, a little <laughs> after three. And I said, yeah, that's very typical of something coming in your room. Yeah. There's and a I time know, for man. it. I, I can't tell you. I don't. Like maybe this 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 uh, bolo tie w was just a, like another magical object. And if the story's even to be believed, you know. Oh, well, yeah, of course. About, about the tie. Yeah. But, you know, maybe similarly to that, that trinket that those people bought down in Argentina, it kind of like was influencing his uh, behavior. I'm assuming that this guy was playing craps, right? And winning? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So maybe that magical object, if it, if that's what it was, was, I don't know, like influencing him and probably was responsible for the fact that he was winning. Like if he's giving out like drinks to people, giving tips from his winnings, like, I mean, like that's kind of like a form of accepting gifts from, yeah, you, you, you know. You picked up on that because I was going to, I was going to eventually mention that, but I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, so like if you accept gifts from what is essentially like an entity or like a spiritual being that is working through a man, you're accepting gifts from that spirit. And it, you know, if you're drinking that drinking that liquor or you're accepting the, that money, that's like a form of, of like putting out putting out its energy for other people to, to, I guess, to influence other people. I don't know. I was thinking that too. Like if that was like some kind of talisman. In other words, he could have just been like a vessel. I was thinking more like if it, you know, because I was trying to think of like the the first story as well. Is like why would that creature just let them have it and then just take it away from them? And I said, well, if it was trying to recharge that object or talisman or whatever thing it is, and like it just it, it does that to so that it could recharge it. It might be the same thing with this guy to where he actively uses its power to whatever you know perform whatever good deeds he wants, but then he'll send that thing out to recharge it using either like fear or, or, you know, that's confusion so that it just releases that energy. The creature grabs that energy and brings it back so that this guy can use it again. It might be the same thing with that first story where like this guy, he'll let that thing go out, let someone buy it, be traumatized by it, soak up all that energy and then pick it back up and use it for whatever it's needed to be used for. And, it, and you know, you said it, like, especially since it was supposed to be, like, it seems like it's just the top part of, like, some kind of figure where it was just, like, the head of, a, of like, a figure or something. It might be, like, where he just does that and then later he combines it all together or, like, brings it back together when it was supposed to be all recharged. I, I asked her this question, too, and, I, and I, I said, Marianne, let me ask you a question. And I really I, I was interested the fact that she had seen a Bigfoot when she was in her late teens, you know, and, you know, 
there were other people that were involved that saw it too, you know. And I said, do you think it has any connection or bearing on this? And maybe that's why this guy picked her because she saw something, you know. And there was a bit of supernaturalness to it. it, it I don't think it was just a completely flesh and blood creature no, that she saw no because way. the thing that, that, that I'm talking about the Bigfoot. Oh. Yeah, it came out from behind a tree that she said was too small yeah, to yeah, cloak that one it. too didn't make sense either. It's, yeah. It's like you, especially you see some big hairy creature go behind a tree and everybody starts throwing rocks at it. Like, you're, come on. And this thing just well, walks you know, and, out. And, and I asked her too. I said, everybody started throwing rocks at even though they saw this big scary creature. She said that was the thing. Only one of the kids besides her saw, like at a glimpse, he, he wow. got a little better glimpse of it and he was scared. He said it looked like a big hairy guy because he was kind of looking over there. She saw like a like she turned to try to tell the kid, "Come on, we're walking," and there it is. I mean, like real quick. The other two kids were like, "Uh," -uh. so then they started throwing rocks at it. The kid that saw it full on, he was not interested in doing that, <laughs> but she kind of participated. She got you know? peer pressured into it. Yeah, <laughs> she got peer pressured by younger kids. I was like, you're that weak. You get, you get. <laughs> well, I found it funny too, like how they ran out of their cabin. Cause like mm -hmm. one part of me is like, but that thing's out there. Well, but, it was behind the cabin. So okay. when they ran out, the way she said was they ran out, the cabins right next to each other. They just went right back into the next one. Okay. You know, I was going to say like, I don't know. It's like one of those situations where it's like, do I run out or yeah, do I just exactly. let this thing finish? Cause it obviously can't get in. <laughs> just go up and just start like, you know, stabbing it with like you know, <laughs> forks. <laughs> Plastic the skewers forks. for the for the s'mores. Uh, get the marshmallow forks and stab it, because uh, that's what she says. You say we didn't have anything but like these little you know pokers that we yeah. could use for. It's <laughs> so, like what are we gonna do? You know, get the plastic cutlery. <laughs> yeah, they had a flare gun. People next door had a flare gun. So, like two of them walking around with flare guns, and I was like, nobody had an actual pistol. She's like, nope. I was like, oh, that's a mistake. Um, but I guess he you could know, have gone lucky. He could have chose that Bigfoot could have chosen the one summer camp that was doing bow lessons and <laughs> throwing axing <laughs> lessons. I don't know, man. It, you know, it just to me it seems like there was something to this. Um, that, that definitely does make more sense now that maybe because she's already had a previous encounter. Yeah, maybe her eyes were open. I mean, I, I wonder about that because and now another thing too about her. You know, on the, this 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 isn't a big long story either, but. Her and her brother saw their deceased grandmother, like about three days, I think, after she passed. She had passed away from cancer, and then she's like, "We saw our," that she called her Mima or whatever, but that, but they saw her, you know, appear. So, you know, uh, this just came to me real quick. And what if the reason why these cryptids are ghosts or paranormal in general? kind of focus on those who either believe or had past experiences is because the energy you get from like your first experience, although it might be like really strong because you're getting your mind blown, there's still that like energy of like doubt. So like it's, it's not as powerful, but if you've seen something before and then you see something else, you'd be like, this is definitely real. Like this is terrifying because I've had that past experience. So I know that this exists. So like if I see it, Again, it's just going to freak me out. I'm not going to be in my head going like, this isn't real. This isn't real. Where like you might do that on your first encounter where you see something weird and you've never had an experience like that. You go, I'm insane. This isn't real. I'm not seeing something. And you might doubt it where you, know, you might lose some of that energy that they're trying to feed on or whatever they do, whatever their reasoning is for yeah. being little turds. <laughs> Peter, what do you think, Anthony? I mean, I think it makes sense, but I don't know. At the same time, if I was one of these spiritual beings and I wanted to get like some energy from someone, I mean, it would also kind of make sense to to choose a skeptic because it's like you're you're basically destroying their entire worldview. Like that's what you would think, but it's like not. right before their eyes. Or, you yeah, know. but like Tony said, that's those, not that skeptic not. would just rationalize it away. But that's also just not like what we see. Like we don't see a lot of these skeptics who like. Where it's like these things go up to skeptics all of a sudden. There's like, no, if you've had an experience and more than likely something else is going to happen to you. And it's like, well, why? Why does, why do these things choose these people? Is it something that deals with them or is it something to do with these cryptids? Think about it though. Billions of people on this planet. I mean, billions of people, you know, and, and the United States is a large country with a lot of people and, and every country. I mean, there, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people on the planet. Mm-hmm. 
Too many people. Too many people. Yeah, but you think about it though. I mean, the percentage of people that come forward with these stories, it's 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 not real high, but it's becoming more and more prevalent. People seeing these things to where if you stop and think about it though, it's still not like a huge portion of the population. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, but like I said, more and more people are starting to experience these. And I think that there is something to that. I don't think that they want to show themselves to everyone. Yeah, I was I was going to say like why would I why would I try to change a doubter's mind? You know, there's plenty of people around here who do believe in me. Mm-hmm. Why would I change a doubter's mind and give one more person who wants to know about my existence and wants to figure it out or prevent me or stop me or kill me or or capture me or who knows just one more problem. Yeah, man. just just choose the ones that you have and these other ones Maybe it's like a risk reward thing no. because if because if you're gonna mess with someone who is a believer, then there is a risk there because if they're a believer, they could have faith in Christ and and rebuke you. But if if you're gonna target someone who's a skeptic, chances are you know if they don't believe in the supernatural, then then they're not gonna have any kind of faith either. So they're an easier target and it's a safer bet, but it's not as big of a reward. Mm-hmm. And if you go back to the first story we talked about with the, the one in Argentina, like it seemed like it was pretty cut and dry. Whatever this was wanted that thing back. Yeah. yeah. Because whatever, it was imbued with something. And But the, the weird part about that story is the bellhop yeah, why, coming in there and why becoming a him? werewolf. Like, I mean, was it just, you know, and to add to, to what Marietta had said, that this thing looked like um, according to the, the the son's girlfriend, that it looked kind of like uh, he was he was weird looking, like he was a weird looking guy. Just, like he had like a lot of facial hair, and he had really really pronounced eyebrows, and he looked very, you know. And so she, they had kind of thought that he looked weird, maybe commented or remarked on it, you know. And you don't know whether or not maybe that planted the seed to make her dream that. Whereas this thing was already kind of like trying to orchestrate something, you know, because it wanted it back. Mm-hmm. That's what it was. And it was over her bed because it was under the pillow. The thing about that, that doesn't like, it's weird to me because he threw it out. It could have, it could have grabbed it when he threw it out. Why did it come back to them? If it want like, th- that's what I was like. Well, the object came back. Yeah. That's what and I mean. Like, if, they, if it, if it wanted it the came, object. It came back to them. Well, yeah, but how is it going to know? I mean, unless the object comes back and then, I don't know. That's just weird. Is weird. Is like, why, why, why did it do it in that weird, like, sequence of like, oh, now that you don't want me now and that someone else wants me, now I want it. I don't know. Or maybe the thing was trying, it was like a beacon. Like, it went, it knew that, that that they knew when it was, it was there. Mm-hmm. So it shows back up at the hotel room to be rescued by this. And I was going to say anything like, like the thing about doubters and skeptics is like, why is in the cryptids best benefit? If half, if most of the population doesn't believe in them. And if that population that doesn't believe in them actively make fun of the people who do believe and then they'd look down on them. So why would you change that? Like that, that, why would you try to change their mind and make them get on an even page when like most of the population is looks down upon the people that do believe? And are these cryptids though? I mean, come on. I mean, yeah. Some we, phantom that comes in the bedroom doesn't. Paranormal, I guess is the best way to put it, but. Yeah. It, it, but you know, when you, when you, the thing I tell people too, though, I mean, they don't want to listen. They don't want to believe in, you know, the, the ones that want to believe in this flesh and blood thing. You can't explain away these stories. I mean, like I said at the beginning of the show, Nick Redford, he's in my book with his story of a phantom werewolf. The guy who gave me the story, there was another one. He gave me the story. Um, he's he's a, like a, an aeronautical engineer. I mean, this guy has no reason to lie. And he saw this thing <clears throat> come into the, the bedroom, you know? Yeah, and it's, um, not, it's not like it's in the middle of boohoo, you know, nowhere, it's like middle of towns, middle of cities. People like, in their apartments. Yeah, it's just like, it's, so like you can't say it's flesh and blood, an undiscovered creature, and it's like in the middle of your town. It's in the middle of your city, and it's undiscovered. How is that possible? What was the episode we did with Jenna Perry where she saw the bear man looking thing? And what was it called? I think I saw a werewolf or something like that. 
Oh, I don't remember, I don't remember what I titled that one. But so, something along those lines. Jenna Perry, though, I mean, like she was thinking about it, and then it showed up, but it wasn't the way she thought it would look. Yeah. So it wasn't a thought form that she created. It was something that's in the thing was telling her, "I'm real. We're here." You know, it, it's <laughs> it's a puzzling thing, man. I don't think we'll ever really fully understand it because I think that we would have to be you know, out of our bodies, kind of really maybe grasp. And I think maybe that these things, even if they are flesh and blood, they can present their spirit out of their body. Because, I mean, if we come out of our body, why can't they? Yeah. I mean, there's just all these different things that could be going on there. But uh, Oh, this is an interesting question. Now that you said that, do you think it's possible for, I don't know how to describe it, do you think it's possible for one of those spirits to, like, be possessing a person? Yeah. Yeah. And then just act all normal, and maybe that's why she, the bellhop person. Or what What about when she reached up and tried to claw her boyfriend? Yeah. So I think, like, it could have been. You know? Or what if that bolo tie on that guy, the, the Texan that was had the hot hand for the dice, what if he is really, like, just a, a vessel, like you said, one of y'all said. That was like, Anthony, yeah. Anthony, about a vet, you know, just being used by these things. Yeah. Well, There's I, all kinds of things that could be going on. Well, I know that in... Satanism or so, some some form of like one of those silly dark arts uh, practices that there is a belief or like a like a ritual that they do called the atavistic resurgence, where it's like you uh, you basically cast off your your humanity and you give in to all like your your animalistic like primal urges and just kind of become a beast, right? Like in your temperament and your supposedly your physical appearance changes to, to reflect more of, of like the kind of animal that you're, I guess, channeling. But the point is like uh, whenever they do that, whenever they participate in that, going back to what Tony said about uh, how like the spirits of these different cryptids can possess a person. Like what if they're channeling something along those lines to become just like a primal, like the channel is like a very primal animalistic spirit. It's interesting too well folks that's all the time we have for tonight uh, tune in next week as we try to figure stuff out and probably don't but <laughs> anyway we'll try I mean that's that's what we try to do here we tell the stories the, the encounters and, and we try to come up with some ideas you know and maybe most give you some wrong, food most of them might be right who knows yeah, what? food for thought yeah but uh, thank you for listening and good night <laughs>